You're listening to Beat Autoimmune and Thrive, the podcast all about reversing and preventing autoimmune conditions so you can live your most vibrant life as soon as possible. We talk about autoimmune root causes, actionable solutions, and inspirational healing stories. I'm Palmer Kippola, and I used to have MS. Today, I'm an author, a speaker, a functional medicine certified health coach, a pickleball player, and nature lover who's helped thousands of people reclaim their health and their best lives. Let's dive into this episode. I am super excited to be here with Dr. Cynthia Lee. She is a conventionally trained medical doctor and author whose personal healing journey through a disabling autoimmune condition took her from public health in underserved populations to both integrative and functional medicine. After graduating from medical school, she practiced internal medicine in both clinical settings and in public health settings, including with Doctors Without Borders in rural China. Cynthia has studied and practiced with functional medicine experts, environmental health scientists, acupuncturists, and Qigong masters, weaving together cutting-edge science and the ancient healing arts. She is the author of this wonderful book called Brave New Medicine, A Doctor's Unconventional Path to Healing Her Autoimmune Illness. Today, she has a rich and full life with her family in Berkeley, California, And to stay grounded and balanced, Cynthia continues to practice wisdom healing Qigong twice a day, every day. And I am so happy and honored to call this wise and wonderful woman a dear friend. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Palmer. Oh, great great conversation with you. I am so, so happy to have you with me. And we have a lot to cover today because we're going to dive into your healing story And to get us oriented, we need to start at the beginning. So can you take us back and give us a glimpse of the elements that you believe you might call underlying imbalances that with hindsight, you believe filled the bucket? Because I know our early lives can be multifactorial. They're wonderful in some ways, but I'd love to focus on the parts that you think help to contribute to your own bucket, if you will. Yeah, it's... um... It's always interesting because having written a memoir, I also see how many different versions of the same, or how many different versions of the story we can tell ourselves, right? Of the same childhood. (laughs) So I've been through many different iterations, um, but I will simplify things. I'll just say that um, I grew up the first generation. I was the second daughter of uh, immigrants to this country. So I was the first generation right, raised in America. And um, my family, uh, ethnically Chinese, uh, my parents had grown up actually in war in uh, when they were young, young kids in China and had dodged that with their families, um, got displaced to Taiwan, very gratefully so, but they were raised there. Then both Um, came to the States for graduate school, you know, kind of the classic immigrant success story. Um, But that was part of the culture in which I grew up in. So it was very much a um, uh, one of gratitude of being in a land of plenty and being a land of safety and yet uh, very much a survival uh, mindset as well. Um, When I was very young, my family was not rich, and I do remember a lot of financial stresses. And just as a very sensitive child, I they they were very big stresses for me, even though I never lacked for food, I never lacked for clothing or shelter. Um, My family, when I was six, moved from upstate New York to Texas. So we were in the heartland of Texas, where... Uh, there were no or very, very few uh, people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> everybody was very friendly. Um, but there was this sense that I was kind of invisible because I was different. And that there was a certain way in which uh, every young girl ought to look. And I didn't look anything like that ideal. So um, that was the culture 
um, around me. And then there was my family culture. So I was number two. I had an older sister and then I had two younger brothers. And the Chinese culture highly favors boys. Um, and I was also the second girl of a sister who was kind of just the, in my eyes anyways, right? We look up to our older siblings. She was a year older than me. She was, uh, she moved th through the world very easily in my eyes. She was social. She was uh, funny. She was ambitious. She was curious. And, um, and I felt like I was kind of the opposite. I was very shy. I was very sensitive. Um, and I was very introverted. <clears throat> and so I just always felt like I was um, in spirit and presence and everything. And then there was the, um, the evangelical community that I grew up in. My parents were uh, Christian and deeply so. Their relationship was really founded on Christian values. And they were founding uh, members of a very, very small Chinese evangelical church. And uh, as the Chinese community in Texas, in this area grew, the church grew as well. So we were, I was not technically a pastor's kid, but our family sort of had that role. And I felt very much in a fishbowl right? Being examined for how, how moral we were, you know, um, how, how we did in school. I mean, the whole bit. And there was a lot of disconnect for me in terms of what, who am I authentically? Mm -hmm. Who is our family? Who, who are we in the world? Um, and so, you know, a lot of this was in hindsight, but my experience as a young child was one of very much um, confusion and feeling invisible. Yeah, there, there is, thank you for describing that. There's a part in the book early on where you write about your parents loved you mm -hmm. and not because they hugged you or they told you they loved you, but because they prayed for you. Yes, absolutely. I, I got that sense that it was sort of this love from a distance, right? Right. And it was, and that was, I think that was the other piece that was hard was that the Chinese culture in general, especially from their generation was not an affectionate one. It was not direct by any means. Like we, you know, the, they would hold all of their emotions I mean, even joy, but grief, especially any mm. kind of burden very close and, and yeah. internal. Um, so it was, uh, but yet we were raised in America. And so we would see people who were, mm. you know, much more demonstrative and mm. direct and experience that. And so I think it's very different. And again, I don't know because I didn't grow up there, but if ever, if the whole culture were like that, it would be a little bit more normalized <laughs> But right. there was, again, there was, that was where I think a lot of the confusion came from was in the Chinese culture also, you know, you, you were de deferential to your elders, whether they were siblings or uh, adults. And so number two was kind of a, you know, like a place of honor and yet deference. And then we were raised in this culture where everyone was supposed to be number one. Mm. And so there were, you know, so sort of the, the clash of cultures. Yeah. Um, and also being in a culture which was deemed overtly or or inadvertently um, inferior, mm. right? Not the dominant, yeah. not the mainstream accepted one. So, so yeah, so that's where it was. And like, I always knew that my parents loved me, but I could not, in my body, I could not feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you talk about, I, I just want to shine a light on this one piece of this, that healing happens when we discover, as we discover who we truly are. And you had kind of the double whammy for many of us who grew up in America, you know, white as a lily, um, still had living in the shadow of parent parental expectations mm -hmm. or raised to be the perfect one or in a household where there was some sort of trauma that was 
overt, right? The verbal abuse, physical abuse, and so forth, neglect. And we have those elements, those adverse childhood experiences that end up building and building and building. You had the double whammy of having, you know, the other, the cultural element that many of us don't face. So here you are with these pressures to begin to excel at school and to become number one in a culture that values number one while you're number two in the family. I I just think it's fascinating. And so talk about how and when did you start experiencing symptoms? Because I know a lot of time went by. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of time went by. And I just want to add to, I think for like my family uh, and in this evangelical community was for me, like, you know, years later when I talked to my parents about it, they said they just, they didn't know, you know, they wish yeah. they had known, but that's right. The evangelical uh, message about heaven and hell, like that's kind of where this drive for, I, I mean, I didn't experience it as perfectionism, but this drive for being a good person, like the best person I could be mm. uh, prescriptively. Right. Right. Uh, otherwise I'm going to go to hell, but I was tormented by, um, everybody else going to hell, right. All mm. the the children and the people around me that I was seeing who were not Christian. Um, and I didn't, I never felt Christian enough. So wow. it was, um, that I would say was, was the primary fear Mm -hmm. Um, and then in terms of my parents, like they were actually very liberal for Chinese first generation immigrant parents, because we, we knew people around us and our cousins too, who had a lot of academic pressure. And my parents were like, you know, we want you to choose what you're going to be happy with because what you love is going to, it's going to be your passion. And we want you to make a good living, but it was the, um, the pressure for academics was not in, you know, was not put upon by them, but it was a way later that I discovered uh, I can use my knowledge to understand and sort of come on the other side of this existential angst that I was feeling Yeah, uh, around, yeah, around heaven and hell and going to hell. So Beautiful. Yeah, so lots of time passed. When did I start having symptoms? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, when do I start? I Where mean, do you start? <laughs> I mean, there were, uh, yeah, there were times, like one thing that I remember very clearly was uh, when I started having very bad motion sickness. So mm-hmm. it, it started out as dizziness, right? And I was in middle school, but like nobody else around, nobody in my family had it. And in fact, they were sort of the opposite. Um, they'd go on any kind of boat, any kind of plane, anything, and they would be fine. And so what I ended up sort of internalizing my story was, oh, I'm kind of the weak one in the mm. family. You know, so, so I'm already kind of thinking like I'm weak um, or weaker or more delicate. Uh, my constitution can't handle it. I'm so sensitive and all that. Um, I would say... That said, you know, it was quite normal, right? Lots of people have motion sickness. And um, when I was in medical school, and I will say it takes a lot of mental, emotional, physical, spiritual rigor to get through medical school and residency. I mean, just to do it. Oh, yeah. So I felt really like, oh, I'm, I'm quite invincible. Like I've gotten to the place where I'm very strong. And I hadn't realized I was having a lot of symptoms then. Like I would do a 36 hour call uh, shift. And then the next day I would feel, you know, of course, exhausted. Everybody was exhausted, but I would feel really dizzy, really. Mm. dizzy. And my, my muscles were achy. Mm-hmm. And I just assumed that everybody experienced that. Right. I mean, you don't talk about it. And then of course you're tired. And then, Oh, this is what happens when you're tired. So I hadn't, put two and two together that, oh, my whole hormonal stress response is being completely taken to the edge and not compensating. But then, you know, I would get a good sleep and then uh, the symptoms would go away. And then the next thing that happened was I started having insomnia. 
So despite being exhausted, I couldn't sleep. And uh, so, you know, I'd say that was kind of the beginning of the symptoms, but um, I was still highly, highly functional and, um, you know, nothing slowed my life down. So when did the symptoms really hit the fan? <laughs> was, I guess was when I became pregnant. Um, so common. Yeah, I became pregnant. I was 33. Um, and again, I would say that, so first off, I, I got pregnant very easily. You know, that was another affirmation for me that, oh, I'm really healthy. You know, I'm really fertile. Um, but, and then was quite unremarkable, except for the last couple of months, I started having palpitations, which uh, were not sort of just the skipping around, were just these sustained, very, very rapid, which I knew was named mm-hmm. Um, and then I had really debilitating carpal tunnel syndrome. I was still working as a doctor, but like I had to wear brace wrist splints the whole day, like to type, I couldn't even type at one point. And it was just really seen as, you know, fluid retention, inflammation from pregnancy. And, um, I didn't know then that that was that both of those are related to thyroid imbalance and adrenal mm. imbalance. So that was the first. And then of course, then, you know, my story, which I write about is the the overt beginning of disease that's diagnosable was postpartum thyroiditis. And that happened about three to four months after my first daughter was born. Right. Right. And then things mount because I don't know how long after your first daughter, you had your second daughter or when you actually went to the doctor, like you're a doctor, when do you go to the doctor to get a quote diagnosis? And did a doctor in fact say that you have postpartum thyroiditis? Was that made known to you? Yeah. I mean, I, um, I was, I would, I just decided I'm going to be a really good patient. Um, not only that I was a mother. So I felt like it was not just my life. Like I'm going to do this for my daughter Mm -hmm. and for my husband. So I sought out um, the top-notch specialist um, at the academic institution where I lived. And, uh, and he was the thyroid expert as well on top of being a, you know, hormone expert. And, uh, and I was diagnosed um, and I took the, uh, the prescribed medications I was overactive and then I was underactive. I was on this roller coaster. And uh, about a year after I was diagnosed, my symptoms largely resolved. I was, I had residual palpitations, insomnia, and um, kind of this very low grade ache. Like it wasn't mm. pain, just, you know, kind of stiffness, achiness. And I just assumed um, that that was, that was just how life was going to be. Mm. Um, and again, I was totally functional. I, I didn't even, I was still in that mindset of like, you know, I wasn't complaining. I was grateful. I was living my life and this is, this is what it is. So, uh, it didn't feel at that point, um, like any kind of, I don't know, hindrance to me. Right. And then you have baby number two. And then I get pregnant with baby number two uh, in Beijing. We're visiting my family. My parents had moved back to Beijing some 20 years earlier. And uh, yeah, I had a a near-death experience there. And then when I woke up, I was in this emergency room. And I learned, I didn't know at the time, of course, but when I woke up, I didn't recognize my body. Mm. Uh, I couldn't really move it. I was so fatigued. I was so achy and I was perpetually in vertigo. So at the time I thought that, Oh, you know, I got this nasty gastroenteritis, which I did. And my husband had it. My, our daughter, our toddler at that point had it. This is two years after I had the first daughter. Um, and I just thought, Oh, this is really bad. It's just going to pass. So, Mm -hmm. but it was the beginning of what would be, chronic fatigue syndrome, dysautonomia, these, you know, 
horrendous conditions that nobody can pronounce or or want or or even believes are are exactly. real exactly well right. and at that point yeah I didn't even know that these conditions I knew they were diagnoses I didn't believe them to be real or I didn't even know what the hell they were um but it was the beginning of that and it was the beginning of my second pregnancy got it you must have been absolutely terrified I'm envisioning you are in a foreign country, albeit it's your family country, but it's foreign to you and your family. And you're going through this experience where you nearly died. You, didn't you pass out in the bathroom or you just completely blacked out? I was sitting at the table. We were sitting at, a, at the table. Yeah, we were at a dumpling house having the feast of our life. And oh. I just, my whole life flashed in front of me. And yeah. And I, I came to a moment of peace though, before that. Mm. You no, know, I saw I saw my life flash before me, and wow! And I knew that my daughter would be fine. I knew that mm. my family would be fine. So it was, and I would say it was less terror at that point, um, and for a, quite a long time because yeah. I also didn't know what was ahead of me. Yeah, it was more uh, just overwhelm. Yes, it was like I didn't even have a chance to get to get to the place of fear. Right. I was just trying to survive moment by moment. Right. Right. So then take us through the experience because I know at this point you try different things and you are a medical doctor yourself and you have this cognitive dissonance that maybe autoimmune conditions aren't even real and tests and how do you negotiate that? Just give us a snapshot of this period because I know it's it's just a re- must be such an interesting emotionally up and down time. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was all over the place, um, I, and I didn't need the postpartum hormones to <laughs> to compound it or too young. No. Uh, so I will just say first off, I had a lot of support, and my husband reached out for a lot of support. He and I, our marriage was really strained um, under the circumstances. Oh, and, sure. Uh, but, you know, I can't say enough um, for that, or just reaching out. Uh, I did have, I would just, I'll kind of fast forward. I had a second health crisis um, years later after a lot of healing. And that second time, I just remember like without hesitation, reaching out for support, right? Like we got to, you know, let's reach out to my family. Let's reach out to the friend. Like I did it actually in a very different way than I had the first time. Mm when I had a lot of shame about it, I had, you know, and it was just at this place where I was thinking, God, you know, I wish in hindsight, I could have just gotten over myself, you know, Mm -hmm. just get past myself, reach out for help and take it. Um, (laughs) But it took me about two years of being uh, housebound, fully housebound for two years to start doing that. Like, luckily I had my husband who was doing it, you know, kind of for us, but I myself had a very hard time reaching out Oh yeah. and I was very much stuck within my own um, uh, belief, disbelief and all that. Um, and uh, the, I don't even remember now you know, looking back what the first step was because they all kind of blend together. Um, but we did have these people who, these friends who entered our lives that opened up in new ways, right? So when, when someone, you know, in this case, me is really at the edge of life, like people open up in ways where uh, they might, may have been restrained in the past. And so like we had friends that we had known for years who, I don't know, kind of came forth with their intuitive gifts and just shared with us what they were seeing and what we might try. Um, I had. Uh, uh, the gift of my daughter's, my older daughter's first dentist visit, you know, where she had all these cavities and we were in complete dismay about it. And also we couldn't believe why she would have so many. And next thing I know, I'm researching teeth and gut health and diet. And it really led me then personally onto this journey of whole foods, ancestral diets and why that's important. And what does that mean? How do I cook? Um, how do I prepare food? Uh, the whole bit. And 
you know, I hadn't realized at the time, I was still very much in my doctor's prescriptive mind. I hadn't fully grokked that what it's doing for, what things like that are doing for me are connecting me to my body and connecting me to life, right? Connecting me to nature. Like, where does my food come from? Why does it matter? Um, what kinds of meats I eat? Why does it matter what kind of diet I eat? Why is the diet that I eat now different than what I needed five years ago and what's going to be different 10 years from now? And that I am an ecosystem and I am constantly changing. Um, so this, um, this deep desire as a human being and also as a doctor, just to kind of want to box things up and even now, you know, like I have this desire of just, okay, here we're not healthy. And then here's how right. here and stay here. And it doesn't, you know, we, we're ecosystems. We don't just stay static. You know, we don't fix a machine. You know, <laughs> of our body. And so it's just a journey. And it sounds trite, but it just keeps moving our bodies, our lives, and our health. And so in that sense, where I am now, it's, um, it keeps me feeling alive. It never stagnates. And so each day brings new surprises and new challenges and uh, new ways of learning and no, new ways of just understanding who it is that I am, you know, going back to what you were saying, like healing is really getting in touch with your authentic self. And um, I just feel like I'm continuing to deepen into that. Mm. Um, so even as I'm, you know, uh, I will say supplements helped me tremendously. Um, just replete the nutrients I was deficient in. And uh, my regimen has simplified considerably as I've healed. And as I've been able to get more from my diet, right, I can digest better, I can absorb better. Um, and just as I deepen in my Qigong practice too, which is a embodied consciousness practice, which is huge in my life. Um, but yeah, each step of the way, I'm just recognizing whether it's supplements, whether it's reading new information, whether it's connecting with friends like you, it's all just, it just goes back to energy. How are we as energy beings, right? How are we receiving energy? How are we incorporating it? And then how are we uh, transmitting energy? What are we giving out back to the world? Mm. And um, so it's actually quite simple. You know, it's quite simple. And as a functional medicine doctor, you know, I know that things can get complex very quickly. So even in my medical practice, I'm really learning how do we simplify things to the essentials? What is necessary right now? Um, it makes things more complicated in that the, the prescription is constantly changing. Right. Um, but it that's just how our bodies work. And if we simplify it down to energy. We are energy. What we're eating is energy. What we're doing is energy. What we're putting out is energy. How do we make best use of it? Um, and then that of course ties back to even my evangelical teachings, right? I've gone deep into the Christ mysteries and righteousness, righteous living, uh, the original sort of deeper esoteric meaning of that word is the right use of energy. Wow. So yeah, very, very different than how I had received that information and interpreted it when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like kind of living within a moralistic, um, very rigid framework. That's right. So, yeah. Oh, so, so, so beautiful and so many questions. But one that just is emerging for me right now is this concept of grief mm. and making um, sense of or completing or exploring or having the courage to look at 
grief, the grief of the childhood that we didn't get. This is not, you know, this is your story that we're talking about now, but this is so universal, yes. right? Yes. That this concept of forgiveness is really about freeing ourselves f- for a past that we wanted, but never had. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I did a lot of grief work with Francis Weller, who's a grief therapist, um, but he, his real gift is uh, actually in working with grief through ritual. And so what I learned also through Qigong and just also, I mean, being in medicine is that so much of illness, if not all illnesses occur uh, short of right, acute infections or traumas uh, when we are disconnected from our bodies. So from childhood, you know, I, I learned very early on, it's not safe you know, detach, but the detachment actually is a dissociation. So even though I'm moving around in my head and my, my mind and my body are still connected, they're not really connected. Right. So another example is like people who are, um, who are running right outside, they're jogging, but they're listening to a podcast and there's nothing wrong with it. And their body's still receiving some benefit from the movement. Um, but their mind is thousands of miles away. They're, it's not yes. in the body, right? So we do that all the time throughout our day. And, um, but it's a pattern that's been likely established in childhood, not just from trauma, but just from the way the Western and the information digital age works. So the body cannot keep up with the digital pace, right? So we kind of just then detach. And um, one of the the scariest things and the hardest things for me was, oh my God, in order to heal my body, I have to inhabit it again, to go into this body that's so uncomfortable um, and to go into the places that scare me, which was literally myself. And the grief work um, with Francis Weller and, you know, I, I wasn't, I hadn't, he wasn't like a therapist that I saw for countless sessions. I just went to two grief rituals. Um, They were day long rituals and really learning how to release the grief from my body. Um, And in that sense, it doesn't even matter what the grief is. It all comes out indiscriminately. And uh, I didn't quite even know why I was there. I knew I had a lot of grief from the time I lost um, from, you know, the autoimmune conditions and the chronic fatigue. I, um, and, and you mentioned the childhood that we didn't have, things that we expected and didn't get. Um, these are all different phases of grief. And so I learned from him as well that there are these different phases of grief. So you, you touched on one and then there's the, just the grief of losing people that we love, right? And so that was a big piece. I had lost my beloved when I was in medical school. That was, oh, that was another piece of trauma, right? Or the grief that wasn't dealt with, right? Um, He died in a car accident and I, people just kept telling me to go back to work and live life uh, like I normally do. And I did. And yet day in, day out, I was still resident at the time. I was facing everyone else's grief and trying to just be the perfect doctor. So that gets suppressed in the body, even though my mind, my mind totally cleared it out, but the body is where the subconscious is stored and everything just gets shoved down. So, um, the loss of people, you know, everything that we love, uh, we're going to lose, right? So that's a big grief. Um, the sorrows of the world. So what's happening to natural habitats. Um, and that's huge right now with the pandemic. Um, and ancestral grief. So grief that's been passed down and things that we absorb culturally and within our families. And so these are all just um, different faces, but what's beautiful and simple about doing embodied consciousness work like rituals and like this Qigong practice that I do, and there's countless others, is that we can, in a way, we can bypass the story. I don't even have to know what the grief is about. I don't even have to know why my shoulders are tense. It doesn't matter if it's from childhood, if it's from something that happened today, 
with my husband <laughs> or all the patient stuff that I'm carrying around or COVID, God knows, you know, anything, if I can go into the body and release it, all those stories heal. And so it simplifies things. It makes things much faster. And had I known that, I would have gone much deeper into the daily mind, body, spirit practices much earlier on. Oh, so beautiful. And I can't let you get away without taking us a level deeper into this because you opened it up and it's so beautiful. Can you give us a glimpse of what that grief ritual is that you might do on a daily basis or as needed Mm -hmm. to allow whatever needs to come up? And I just love that because sometimes when people think about healing trauma, it's really scary because they're afraid of reliving something. And it sounds like this is a way to bypass the story, to go directly to, uh, I, for lack of a better term, a perfect place of, of just being without the story. Yeah. So do you have a particular embodied practice? Is it within the Qigong framework or is it something different? Yeah, I mean, so when when I went to the rituals with Francis Weller, it was about th- uh, one of them was about thirty people, one was sixty people, and you know he has a whole way of of doing it where um, uh, there's like an altar, you know, and you kind of bring things that represent what it is that you're grieving. So there there's that piece, but really what I'm doing now, is, and there's a huge value for that, and I don't know if I. I don't know, you know, I don't know, because that was my path. I don't know if I could get to where I am right now with my Qigong practice, had I not gone through like a massive release. Uh, But I imagine I could, I think the massive release would have come earlier, like in my Qigong practice. So but what I do now, um, day in, day out is, uh, depends on the day, but so much of of Qigong is um, simple, you know, people always talk about, oh, these, these, old ladies in the park doing these gentle movements. I want to do that. And I was thinking, well, be careful because the movements are, they look gentle, but A, they move our bodies in ways that are not uh, comfortable. So first off, we're choosing to move into discomfort, which is a very interesting thing. Over time, you learn to be unafraid of discomfort because you've been choosing to go into it every day. So you have a different relationship. You have a sense of agency, like, Oh, you know what? Oh, COVID. I can do this. I got it every day with my own body and I'm going, I can do this. I know how to do it now, you know, and it's, it's a bodily intelligence um, coupled with consciousness. And then the other piece is that we're not just moving the body as exercise, we're learning again how to um, how to open ourselves to a, a universal energy that is infinite. So that when we are giving, we're not giving out all of our own energy and getting depleted. We're actually we're kind of like an open faucet, right? So that's mm-hmm. what we talk about flow. So there's flow in, and then there's flow out. And so one super simple practice that anybody can do anywhere is just as simply, and it's, it's amazing how powerful it is and how um, also uneasy it can feel at times, right? But literally is just holding the palms, right? The palms are active. So they're, it's almost like you're holding a ball of light, okay, towards your heart. And literally just gently, and if you can, using your mind to just gently allow the energy to open up. So it's as if the heart is almost opening up the hands. So you're not even moving the hands or the arms. Can you feel that, Palmer? I can. So what happens when we have a lot of grief, right? We constrict the heart because the heart has been hurt. So our energy tends to be very contracted there. And, you know, at the beginning, like I couldn't open it up beyond this, like this felt like, okay, it's challenging, but 
So we don't want to be too comfortable because then healing doesn't happen. Change doesn't happen. We want to be a little bit uncomfortable, right? But the beauty of Qigong too is that incremental change is within your agency. So you just move it out. And then each time more and more, and you know, suddenly you're like, you're like this. And the thing is, when you do this too, you can visualize, right? Like you are offering your grief, whatever that is. It doesn't even matter. Like I said, you're energetically offering whatever your heart is carrying, grief, joy, love, all of it back to the universe, where it came from. And then when you draw in, you're drawing in all that infinite light from the universe. So it becomes a breath. So with Qigong, every movement, you're basically learning how to breathe with your full body. Right? And so every breath, we're, we're drawing in fresh air, you know, that's just percolating through our blood and all of our tissues. And then every exhale, we're getting rid of stuff that our body doesn't need anymore. So we're suddenly in tune with all these practices, these life processes in our bodies that are happening all the time. And then we learn how to enhance that with uh, breathing with our whole body. Mm, that is so powerful. And the other thing that I'm noticing that it does is to make sure that I, my mind isn't someplace else. Yes. It's tethered to the breath. It's tethered to this movement. It feels like it's just in the present moment. Is that the experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so one of the things that Qigong in the deeper practices teaches is actually, right, our minds are usually outward, right? So like, if I'm grabbing this cup of tea, this jar of tea, because I want it, it's, we're very much objective, like I, it's goal oriented. Right. Instead of like, first off, what is the experience of my hand touching this jar? And secondly, I am choosing to connect with this jar and this tea, right? That I'm going to now drink. Um, and so when we do that, actually all of our energy is going outward. So one of the deeper practices is actually to draw the mind back into the center of the head. Just try doing that. And how, how foreign that feels often. And even for me now, I'm like, oh yeah. I got to draw my mind back to the center and then even deeper dropping the mind then into the heart and then dropping the mind into the navel. So at the navel is where, so when the mind and the body are deeply connected, that's where the mind rests. So giving our minds permission to rest is incredible. And so when our busy minds can rest, we become open to the full experience of life, which is the source of healing. So wow. I now prescribe Qigong to all of my patients. <laughs> now, whether they do it or not <laughs> is their uh, choice, right? Um, but some of these practices are so simple. Um, but simple doesn't mean easy. No, but it is a path and it is a path that you described so beautifully. And I think even in these few minutes of that description and that embodied experience, I, I think that people are going to get a taste of what that is like. Because in my experience, people are afraid to pause mm -hmm. because when we're quiet, when we're not distracted, there might be pain that comes up. There might be something that fills that void. We're really used to thumbing and scrolling and clicking and preferences and all of this. And I think what you've just described is that you've prescribed, not just described, but it's the pause. It's, it's really a connected pause, right? It's yeah. just, it's just perfect. This has been such a pleasure being with you. I was going to say talking with you, but I feel like it's really been this, this experience of being and tell us, I, first of all, want people to get your book because as I wrote on Amazon, this is a must read for doctors. Honestly, it is, it is such a beautifully written book. It's part memoir, part prescriptive. And 
just go- a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, how can people find you and learn more? Um, my website is up, CynthiaLeeMD.com. And Lee is spelled L-I, CynthiaLeeMD.com. And um, if, is this going up this week or no? Um, um, let's, let's share it this week. I know you've got something that's coming up. So, yeah, so tell us more. Okay, this is, um, you know, kind of late notice, but starting this Sunday, there's actually a, um, a 14 day challenge really. I mean, we call it a gong. So it's like qigong, um, gong means work or effort, right? So the path of healing and awakening, uh, requires a dedication to work and effort um, really directed at ourselves. And um, so one of the hardest things is for people to continue to practice. So um, uh, one of my primary Qigong teachers, uh, Master Ming Tonggu and I are um, putting together this 14 day challenge uh, that's offered f- uh, freely on mm-hmm. service space. Uh, dot org service space dot org um and i don't actually i don't have off the top of my head the link to that uh the sign up page but uh, i can give it to you Palmer. i guess Maybe yeah i'll put it at the bottom of this it. when we post this so that yeah. people will know where to go and okay. we're talking this is december 6th is that the the date that's of 2020. Yes. 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 And yes. service space is a yes. wonderful organization. So if people, if people see this and they've missed December 6th, there are more opportunities to learn about Cynthia on her website, to get her book and to check out servicespace.org. Is that right? Yes. And if they have one of service spaces projects called awaken with an I awaken K I N.org um, has a, uh, a podcast where I interview uh, Master Ming Tong Gu. And then he basically takes it over and does a teaching workshop. So for anyone who's interested in an introduction to that, and then on that podcast page, there's a whole bunch of resources on how to get started. I love it. Well, what a wealth of information. And I just love how you blend the cutting edge science with these ancestral healing arts and bring them together for everyone who is open to this. So thank you for going through your journey and sharing this beautiful book and your soul with, with the world. Thank you, Palmer. I love this. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Yeah. Likewise. Okay. Bye. Bye. And that's a wrap. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, share it with your friends and family. And if you feel inspired, please leave a quick review so other people can find it too. Now, if you want to beat autoimmune and thrive, make sure you sign up for my free video training at freeautoimmunetraining.com. That's freeautoimmunetraining.com. And watch the first video right away. Take good care. Bye for now.